Just let me know when. And it's recording. Excellent. Good morning, folks. Good afternoon to some. Welcome and thank you for attending today's webinar hosted by the California Telehealth Policy Coalition and California Association of Long-Term Care Medicine. This event is sponsored by West Health, AARP of California, and the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. Representatives from these organizations, including myself, will be moderating and facilitating today's webinar. I'm Mike Curlin of West Health, a suite of nonprofit, nonpartisan mission-driven organizations that are dedicated to lowering healthcare costs to enable seniors to successfully age in place with access to high quality, affordable healthcare that preserve and protect their dignity, quality of life, and independence. The organizations include a policy center whose focus is on policy research and advocacy, a foundation that does outcomes-based philanthropy, and an institute where I'm based out of that is focused on applied medical research. A component of our work at the Institute is to educate and share content related to our work that we believe will improve clinical and operational outcomes. This can come in the form of, what, of a webinar such as this, workshops that we co-facilitate, and documentation such as how-to guides like this one that you can download for no cost. Next slide, please. And all these links and uh, content will be available for you uh, for free for download and to listen again at another time. Uh, today's webinar will focus on new and evolving information for post-acute long-term care delivery models. Uh, um, pardon me. Uh, today, <laughs> today's webinar will focus on new and evolving information for post-acute long-term care delivery models. We'll cover some of the latest information from frontline clinicians, administrators, and legal experts. We'll discuss key areas of consideration for implementation, such as protocols, staffing, technology, and law. We'll do all this through the lens of the COVID-19 pandemic. We ask that participants stay muted during the webinar and post any questions you have in the chat box. I'd like to quickly introduce several guest speakers. Dr. Steve Handler is an associate professor with a primary appointment in the Division of Geriatric Medicine, where he is the director for geriatric telemedicine programs. He is a practicing geriatrician and direct patient care rep and has direct patient care responsibilities in the nursing home and hospital settings. Josh Hoffmeyer is the Avera eCare Senior Care Officer in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. He has been a licensed long-term care administrator for over 10 years and is also certified as a health services executive. He is licensed and works across multiple states overseeing telehealth services operating in over 80 locations across 10 states. And right now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mike Wasserman for a quick, brief message to the long-term care community. Thank you, Mike. Um, you know, I've been in touch with physicians on the front lines of this crisis for almost a month now. And uh, they're crying out for things to help them. And telehealth uh, is an incredible opportunity on multiple fronts. And I, I think one of my big um, passions is integrating the, the frontline knowledge into workflow of the technology that we put together. And I think uh, the recent government uh, um, Guidance opens some doors to pretty much do whatever we need to do. But I, I want to challenge everyone, work with the clinicians on the front lines to find out what they need. Make sure you get it to them in real time. And I think there's such a huge opportunity right now uh, to demonstrate the value of telehealth, especially in nursing homes, assisted livings, homes, group homes, where our most vulnerable members of society live. Um, and I think it's not just simply um, physicians billing for visits and making things happen. I was on a, uh, CalTCM and AMDA have put together a expert group to talk about hospice and palliative medicine and helping folks deal with their advanced directives. One of the things we run into is who's going to have those conversations? We, we, we don't have enough people coming into the buildings. We're trying to keep people out of the buildings. So, you know, I, I 
as an example, I, I, I've long known the folks with mydirectives.com and they, there's different folks out there that have technology that we can get to patients, residents, their families, and help them identify their advanced directives right now, which if COVID hits their facilities, is unfortunately going to be desperately needed to effectively utilize the resources that we have. So thank you guys all for what you're doing. Um, I think that this is telehealth's time and it's a tough time. And I know everyone probably out there is working almost 24 seven to get actionable technology into the field. And I appreciate it. We appreciate it. AMDA, CalTCM, thanks you very much. And I look forward to hearing from my colleagues and the others on this call in terms of sort of what's, what's available and helping message this out to the community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next slide. I'd like to pass the baton over to Dr. Handler and Josh Hoffmeyer. Great. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me and I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you virtually, uh, perhaps the best way to meet these days, right? Um, however, um, we have a lot of residents and patients we need to take care of uh, in, in the nursing home setting. And I'm gonna walk through um, a fairly disturbing report that I read and included in uh, this discussion, but then really focusing on solutions. Um, and I think things that are actionable, uh, implementable, and then some stretch goals um, uh, that we're trying locally, and I wanna share those with you. So uh, there is this report that uh, y'all can see right now from the MMWR, really talking about the signs and symptoms of COVID-19 and really kind of emphasizing that symptom-based screening may fail to identify many infections. Uh, symptoms uh, may be harder, of course, uh, to recognize because of those with cognitive impairment. Um, and uh, ultimately, the steps to prevent either the introduction of the virus um, and the limited availability of PPE make it very challenging that once it has entered in the facility, and we have one here in the Pittsburgh area uh, where it is entered, unfortunately, it is um, uh, impacting quite a toll on people. So telehealth, um, and you know, really very broadly speaking, um, I believe has the opportunity to help quite a bit, but I also don't wanna oversell or overpromise on it. Um, I'm gonna share with you my guidance and, and what I think um, along the way. So on the next slide, please. Um, so the, the concepts that we're trying uh, to manage right now um, uh, and we're thinking about is how do we um, consider doing forward triage and, uh, or the, the concept of uh, getting someone to a facility uh, to establish whether or not they're clinically stable or even do that before you get there take a specimen, swab, whatever you're using, whether it's a point of care test, et cetera, uh, and do so in a safe manner, and then triage in place, i.e. in the nursing home, so that you don't necessarily increase exposure and make it difficult um, for the resident and then other healthcare providers and the hospital setting. On the next slide, please. This concept um, was, pinned early uh, in this, at least in this country. This is a New England Journal of Medicine uh, article from March 11th by Judd Hollander uh, out of Jefferson in Pennsylvania. And the, the concept of at least the forward triage in nursing homes is that um, you can extend the practice of paramedics in times of resource constraints, provide real-time decision support for emergent management of both adult um, and pediatric patients. We're of course focusing primarily on adult patients assess patients and allowing for alternative care uh, destinations. What's important for this is understanding your resources and dynamically as they change to allocate, if you do need to transfer, what's the best place. Uh, providing clinical guidance and emergency man uh, management and notification to the receiving facility so they're prepared, reducing risk to all of us and patients, improving outcomes, which is ultimately what we're trying to do, and, and satisfaction, which is perhaps a little bit less on this list, or, but certainly important. On the next slide, please. So with regard to having appropriate staffing, um, it's important that we have individuals on the front lines uh, to 
be able to serve the needs. And one of those approaches is to staff centrally through a call service, a telemedicine service or whatever, or even your combination um, of practices working together. What we're trying to do here locally is really try to provide a single number or point of entry for easy consult requests. We understand now more than ever that the consumer or the customer is the nurse. The nurse really needs our help right now. The nursing force is going to take a hit uh, for a variety of reasons. And so we need to make sure that we can uh, provide and serve them. So we need to be able to complete and share documentation and ensure there's qualified, responsive, knowledgeable, and dedicated workforce um, using standardized pre, uh, uh, approaches and coordinating that with pre-hospital transport, as I mentioned on the previous slide. On the next slide. Um, and, and similar to what Mike just said, we really need um, to, to make sure that we have goal concordant care. That is, we have to have these discussions now more than ever. I put a couple of frameworks that you could use respecting choices, vital talk, and then a couple of ways to document those choices, whether it's the pulse or five wishes or, or whatever approach you're using. I think one of the benefits right now, um, and really maybe perhaps I could take this as a moment to address Mike's concern or opportunity rather, is that you can use telemedicine and you could have uh, prior to uh, this crisis uh, to do advanced care planning discussions. And we do that uh, here and it's something that's quite effective and you could do it in their place of setting and the product kind of be a pulsed form or a video or both. Um, the next slide. This is really trying to put all this together and I apologize if it's a little fuzzy, but this is the protocol that we're using um, locally. And basically in the upper left-hand corner, you start where you have um, a resident perhaps with a uh, new cough, shortness of breath or fever. And I list to the right in the green box is what are the initial signs and symptoms broken down by percentage of patients and then follow up. And this, this data was just released in that MMWR report. I cited at the bottom, so if you wanna get it. And it's a little bit scary in that 56% are asymptomatic and, and only then thereafter, these are all COVID positive patients. Their signs and symptoms are not so typical uh, and they really can uh, blindside us. So we have to definitely at this point um, keep up our guard. Once you think you might have someone with either typical or atypical uh, symptoms, in terms of the initial management, you wanna place a surgical mask on the resident, maintain the resident or roommate um, in their room, close doors, et cetera, and go down the pathway while ensuring that your staff is protected. Um, we use screening criteria here locally, which perhaps differs based on your area of the country, but we have a triage whereby combining the clinical pathway with the forward triage on the bottom left, if someone's unstable and the advanced directive supports transfer, then we can bring them in if it's appropriate clinically. Uh, however, if the resident is stable and or the advanced directive doesn't support transfer um, coming out of the decision pathway, then we can do some testing on site, including microbiology, imaging, and signal labs appropriate. So um, I will turn it back over to the group. Uh, there are solutions. Uh, that we can uh, employ quickly um, and uh, we'll continue that discussion. Thank you. Josh, uh, please take over. Yeah, great. Thank, thanks, Steve. And I'll just talk a little bit about, you know, quick start implementations and things that you could potentially be looking at doing now, some things that we've been working on on the operations side um, from the Avera eCare standpoint and just uh, advocacy and policy wise as well. Um, you know, typically the, the manual that uh, Mike referenced at the beginning of this webinar, it has a, a great roadmap and, and numerous things to look at in terms of needs analysis and implementation steps and different things when you're looking to bring telehealth in, but with the environment, as Dr. Handler was saying, that we're in right now, uh, telehealth could never be more important than it is today. And so um, you're certainly gonna want to look at trying to move a little bit quicker than what you typically would if you're looking to implement so you can get things going. Um, and so we've been working and numerous people have been on how do we try to make that a little bit of a quicker um, implementation and, and what can you do? And so. Um, just making sure that you have the right tools in your toolbox and some workflows defined um, is certainly things that are important. Uh, next slide. 
On your end, um, one thing that you'll certainly want to be cognizant of is there will still need to be some assistance um, from a telepresenter standpoint. Um, you know, that can be a nurse, it can be a, a CNA, EMTs, um, MAs can also fill those roles. Uh, but someone that can at least connect with the telehealth provider, let them know what's going on with the resident, uh, what are different things that um, you want the telehealth provider to be looking at and assessing. We've been trialing a lot of different ways to do that to try and help cut down on PPE and different things as well um, in terms of how to use the equipment uh, the best way possible and limit the amount of telepresenter um, presence going into the rooms and different things along uh, that route. Um, but they are very key in helping to facilitate really what's going along, uh, going on with the resident along with um, EMR access and things along those routes as well. Next slide. The equipment and software, of course, are important things to consider. Uh, you know, what are you looking at for sure trying to do? There's a lot of different options out there, especially now with all of the um, different waivers and regulations that have been temporarily waived as a part of this health emergency and different platforms that you can use. But it's still always important to make sure that you're um, making a good educated decision on what platform you are wanting to use and the software they're using. So you can still make sure that the telehealth provider is getting a full picture of what is going on with the resident in your location. Um, and as well as that you're getting the right documentation done for your medical records so that you can keep track of what has all happened. Typically, we recommend um, some type of technology that is mobile. It might run off of wireless signals or it might run off of uh, cell phone signals, something along those lines that you're able to bring right to the resident, especially now as we look at isolation cases and social distancing and trying to keep people um, separate that need to have the technology go to the person versus the person to the technology is very important. Uh, and then a lot of times we will recommend um, technology that also has some peripherals with it so that you can um, have things such as a stethoscope to listen to the heart and lung sounds and an otoscope. Um, I know now a lot of clinicians are um, doing uh, video only or even some phone only, which certainly does help uh, support things. Um, but if you try to take care of some of those more acute cases, uh, looking for something that has um, more with it um, in terms of video and some of the peripherals um, becomes more, more important. And of course, Wi-Fi or cell signal, that's always important. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have the right um, signal strength to be able to do um, the encounters that you're taking on. Next slide. There are a lot of useful toolkits that are out there. Of course, the manual that Mike um, referenced that West Health put together uh, last year. Uh, CMS has developed a useful telehealth toolkit for long-term care facilities as well at this point. It provides guidance along um, Medicare reimbursement, which um, is changing um, very often, and you have to make sure you're staying on top of that. Um, state law considerations, again, right now, those are changing often as well. Technical assistance, vendor selection, a lot of different guides of how you really can go about um, doing this in a more um, hastened fashion than what a site typically might do. Next slide. Um, as mentioned a, a little bit ago, um, HHS is not planning to impose penalties for non-compliance with certain um, HIPAA regulations in some cases. Um, there's been a lot of changes to the regulations and different things um, in terms of what might be audited and where they might um, find deficiencies. And so it's important to know that they really are trying to work with all the locations to um, keep at the forefront resident safety and health and also your staff safety and health with the changes that are coming out um, with survey processes and regulations and HIPAA changes and the Medicare uh, reimbursement for telehealth and things along that line as well. Next slide. Um, so how can you quickly pivot and what are some key lessons to um, consider? Um, so of course, it's important still to align on what are your key needs. Uh, you don't need to figure out what is it that you're trying to do, how do we keep our residents safe, our staff safe, 
um, lower the amount of PPE that we're using. Um, then based on those needs, you can try to identify um, is telehealth a part of the solution or not? And of course, um, I would say that it is. Um, most people on this call would hopefully agree with that as well. Um, it has a lot of benefits in times like this, for sure. And then you start looking at uh, what is the right tool that we can potentially look at to deploy? Again, considering those things I talked about, about Wi-Fi or cell strength, are you trying to get just video? Would you like to have some of those peripherals that you can do the fuller assessments with um, and going down that path? Uh, right now, too, um, purchasing, you know, it could be up and down in terms of what equipment is available out there. There's been a lot of people going out and purchasing different types of equipment. Um, typically, there's probably more um, available than what there would be today, but um, something that you'll have to do uh, homework on for sure. Then you're going to want to really identify who are the couple of key players on your team that can really take the lead on this project and focus in on it and just keep the others updated. We're all wearing many hats these days and trying to do numerous different things and changes are coming at us faster than we can process. And so how do you put one or two people in charge that can really lead this project and who are the right people to, to do that is something you would certainly want to consider. Then looking at easy workflows and things that you can comprehend um, and put out to your staff to be able to use and making sure that they have training documentation um, that's simple and direct and again, easy to implement and put out there. And then once you get that done, you're of course gonna wanna monitor it and adjust where needed um, and just focus on the must adjust items. What are the things that you absolutely have to adjust right now and worry about the other things um, later on down the road would be my um, advice at this point. Next slide. And I believe I uh, hand it over to Anne at this time. Michael. Okay. Thank you, Josh. And uh, thank you, everyone, for having CCHP here today. Uh, next slide. So just really quickly, I always have to start off with a disclaimer that any information provided today should not be considered legal advice. It's purely for informational purposes. Uh, CCHP suggests that you seek out legal counsel if you are looking for a formal legal opinion. And also if I happen to mention a company or show some type of product, know that neither I nor CCHP have any type of financial arrangement or relationship with such a company. Next slide, please. Um, I'm just gonna skip through a couple of these slides because I do wanna leave adequate time for questions here. So uh, next slide. Oh, uh, just really quickly, this uh, was, if you could go back one slide, please. Uh, one of the sponsors of today's event is the National Consortium of Telehealth Research Centers. I just want to inform people who are not familiar with the Telehealth Research Centers that they are federally funded. CCHP is one of them. We are the National Policy Resource Center, um, but there's also another national center on technology and 12 regional resource centers that cover specific states. And they answer your questions from policy to technology to program operational level. So if you do have telehealth specific questions, they're a great resource for you to reach out to. Next slide. One of the things that we do at CCHP is that we track all of the telehealth Medicaid policies, Medicare policies, laws and regulations for all 50 states and the District of Columbia and on the federal level as well. So that information is um, publicly accessible on our website. That is a snapshot of our website. We have an interactive map up there. So if you're interested in what your state is doing, you can click on that. Uh, the information for that is good up through October 2019. We are working on the 2020 update, but as I get more into my presentation, there's been significant changes both on the federal and the state level. So some of that information, it still applies, but there's also been other things that have been going on in response to COVID-19. Next slide, please. So I am going to give you a pretty high level uh, view of what are some of the policy changes that have been going on. Josh mentioned that they have been changing almost daily, um, and they have been. Actually, just be, before this webinar started, we were talking about some new information that CMS just released that we do have some of that here um, with this presentation, but it is an ever-changing environment, both with guidance that's being issued by CMS for Medicare, things that are going on legislatively with Congress, and also on the state level and what different state governments are trying to do to address this uh, COVID-19 crisis with the use of telehealth. 
So just really quickly, um, the next couple of charts are a bit of a combination of federal legislation that's passed and how it's changed the uh, how CMS and Medicare uh, addresses telehealth in the Medicare program, and also guidance that Medicare CMS itself has also issued. So starting off, um, the two biggest things that happened legislatively over the last couple of weeks were removing some restrictions around how you use telehealth in the Medicare program. Pre-COVID-19, you were re really restricted in a couple of areas, and one of them was location of the patient. So you li limited the location of the patient both geographically and the type of site that they were located in. So geographically, it had to be in a rural area or non-metropolitan statistical area, and they had a very specific definition for what rural meant. And it also meant that you had to be in a certain type of healthcare facility. And it was a very short list. It was like hospitals, uh, clinics, um, doctor's offices. It did have skilled nursing facilities on there, but one thing that was missing were homes or other type of residential facilities that I think probably would impact the audience here. So those two things were temporarily waived with recent legislation. So they are basically off the table during this crisis, and CMS has said for Medicare, the patient can be located basically anywhere. And that was really important, particularly as we are all self-isolating or staying at home. So those were major changes that were made. Eligible providers, they also had pre-COVID-19 a very specific list of who could actually be a provider and get reimbursed from Medicare. They did add uh, two additions on there. They added uh, federally qualified health centers and rural health centers who before could only act as sites where the patient were located. They're now able to provide those services over telehealth as what's called the distance site provider. So that is the telehealth provider. So that was recently added with the latest federal bill, which was the CARES Act, HR 74A. Modality. So modality, what they do with modality is essentially said it had to be live video unless you were in Alaska and Hawaii, and then you get to use Storm 4. And that was pre-COVID-19. So right now, what they're saying is, um, it's still, live video is still an option there. Storm 4, they did not increase. Um, what they recently released last night that uh, I did not have a chance to update this particular slide is they are allowing some codes to be used over telephone. So those uh, folks who may not have access to technology um, that would allow them to do live video, they are saying there are some services now that you can provide via phone as well and Medicare will reimburse for it. But there's also a grouping of other types of services that they call communication-based or tech, um, uh, in, inter-technology type based services. They give it a different label from telehealth that use telehealth technologies that they also will reimburse as well. And I'll go into those in a bit later. Um, services, again, did not have time to like update the slide, but they did expand the types of services that are allowed. So uh, that has been expanded as well to different types of services. And I'll get a little bit more into that in a later slide. Uh, next slide, please. So facility fee, it's basically, um, for those who are not familiar, when you act as the originating site where the patient's located in your facility, you get a facility fee. Uh, th what they're saying is you have to follow what's in the existing law, which is the certain list of like healthcare facility fees, which kind of makes sense because if the patient's at home, um, they can't be expected to get like a little facility fee for having their services done at home. It's meant to offset the cost of like those facilities where they're hosting the patient during a telehealth interaction. So um, there was a bit of confusion. So when the first uh, bill addressing COVID-19 in Congress passed, HR 6074, there was a requirement on the provider having a pre-existing relationship. That was removed by the most recent bill, HR 748. So you don't have to worry about that. You can do this with new patients. You did not have to have that pre-existing relationship prior to providing telehealth services. So just to clear that up, that's been removed. It's fine if you're seeing like a new patient for the first time via telehealth. Questions about co-pays and out-of-pockets, do they still apply? What they have said that um, the Office of the Inspector General is providing you with flexibility with that. So providers, you can like reduce them or not not have the copay, and basically they're saying we're we're giving you some flexibility to do that. We're not, not going to punish you, but go ahead and do what you have to do. HIPAA, um, I think um, Josh touched upon this as well. Uh, so yeah, there's there's flexibility there, but keep in mind, especially if you are providing services into a state 
the state may have other laws and protections around health information that um, are different from HIPAA. So keep aware that some of them have relaxed those restrictions and others have not. So you have to be also cognizant of what the states have as far as uh, protection of health information as well. And then licensure. So licensure was something um, that was mentioned in the beginning of all this earlier in the month where, where the Fed said we're waiving licensure limitations. What that meant was they're relaxing some of the rules in Medicare around licensure, which uh, there are some rules and regulations in there where it says you need to be licensed in the state the patient that you're treating is located in. CMS did clarify that with the information they sent out last night that I talked about, mentioned earlier. Um, they said there are certain things that you need to require in order to allow you to practice if you don't have a license in this particular state where the patient's located. And that's, they're, they're fairly um, not strenuous types of requirements from what I can see, basically saying that you are licensed in the state that you're in, that you practice, um, that you haven't been banned in that state or have any type of adverse, you know, uh, cases against you in the state where the patient's located. So they did clarify like what that meant and also what it would require to uh, be able to practice in another state without having a license in that state. Now this is only for Medicare. So this is only if you're treating a Medicare patient and what they're saying there. And you also have to be, again, aware of what's going on in the state and their state laws around licensure. So the feds could not waive those state laws. So uh, be aware of what the state may require. Again, some of them are relaxing some of those licensure requirements. So just check out what the state has like allowed. Next slide, please. So a couple of other things um, that were done around HR 748, there was a dialysis uh, uh, remove waiver of like some requirements, basically for dialysis patients when you were doing telehealth, they required you to have like an in-person meeting. If it was like the, your first initial three months, you had to have an in-person meeting every month. And then afterwards, like every three months, it's in-person meeting. There's, you know, Congress said in the HR 748 changes that you can do that via telehealth. For hospice um, to do your renewal, continue eligibility, it had to be like a face-to-face -face encounter. They're saying you can do that via telehealth. Um, for staffing, there's, there was a change made to staffing um, to in a skilled nursing facility or nursing home. There was, I guess, a rule that says it required a staff member to manage technology and facilitate the interaction. They're saying that um, you, uh, that you can use telehealth for that, uh, or actually that you needed somebody there to, to do that. That is in the uh, nursing home toolkit. It was just something I wanted to highlight that for those to be aware of that they did have that requirement that there's somebody there to help the resident when they're doing that. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, it looks like I am missing a slide or maybe it is in the next one. So I'll just go over these first. So uh, these are some of the other codes that are um, available for people to use and they're not called telehealth by Medicare. They're called technology enabled or communication based services. The benefit of that is that it does not have the telehealth restrictions on there. So pre COVID-19, it wouldn't have the geographical limitations, et cetera. It still doesn't. They have their own limitations around them in that how they um, are applied or you know what qualifies as a service. So for example, the virtual check-in codes, it's pretty self-explanatory. It is literally that it's a quick check-in that a provider has with their patient. It doesn't result in a visit from seven days before and doesn't result in a visit 24 hours afterwards or in a meet or for soonest visit. And they're really short, like five to 10 minute interaction it is literally considered like a quick check-in. Um, but however, you're allowed to do that over video or storm forward or phone. So this is one of the things that you can also do by phone and it's been there actually pre COVID-19. Then there are other services that you can do as well. The interprofessional telephone consult or e-consult, that's a provider to provider consultation. The interesting thing about that is that it will pay both the, um, what's typically a primary care provider side and then the specialist side. So it pays both providers at both ends. And it is that, you know, consultation over a particular um, issue for a patient. And then your remote monitoring services, they have them in different buckets, call them different things, and there are different requirements for them. And then online digital evaluation, and online medical evaluation goes through some type of online portal. So next slide. 
So um, other federal policies um, here to be aware of is that the uh, DEA, um, so if you are prescribing controlled substances, that's controlled by federal law. And the portion that is related to telehealth is um, in, was put into law underneath uh, an act called the Ryan Haid Act. So sometimes you hear that shorthand of like, oh, the Ryan Haid Act when you're talking about telehealth. So they have seven exceptions on how you can use telehealth, or they call it telemedicine in the act. Um, use telehealth to uh, prescribe a controlled substance without having an in-person examination of the patient first. Um, they're very narrow exceptions, but one of them is, is when a you know, public health emergency is declared, and it's been declared in this particular case. So the DEA came out with guidance in that how you do that. So it needs to make sure that it's for a legitimate medical purpose, that the telemed uh, communication system is basically, it's live video, and the practitioner is acting in accordance with other federal and state laws as well. So again, the state laws come in here, be aware, sometimes states might have on their books something a little bit different regarding controlled substance and prescribing using telehealth, so be aware of what that may be as well. Next slide, please. So what are the states doing here? So what the states are doing is that um, before COVID-19, you basically had all the Medicaid programs and fee-for-service uh, reimbursing for live video, at least for some types of services. Store and for remote patient monitoring, not as popular. Next slide, please. They also had on their books some sort of telehealth uh, private payer law. So it ranged from everything from, you know, health plans, you um, may reimburse for telehealth delivery services all the way to health plans, you shall reimburse for telehealth delivery services the same way you would have if it was provided in person. And by the way, you'll pay the same amount and then everybody kind of falls in between there. So that's kind of the, the landscape of where it was pre-COVID-19. But as we are navigating this crisis, you see a lot of states changing these um, policies for this emergency situation. Next slide, please. So what are they doing? So the most common changes that they are making in regards to telehealth is they're allowing the home to be an eligible originating site. So actually pre-COVID-19, not a lot of state Medicaid programs were saying that it's fine to like have a telehealth service in the home. That's being changed. That is probably one of the most popular changes that we're seeing on the state level. They're also allowing phone to be used to provide services well. Recognition that not everybody might have access to the technology, so they're allowing the phone to be used as a means of providing services as well. Again, sometimes a bit like um, caveats to their saying like it must be medically appropriate, but they're, they're basically leaving it, most of them are leaving it up to the provider to decide whether it's appropriate or not to use that. And then the other things that they're doing is they're requiring health plans to cover telehealth services, and it, it, it's kind of ranging from like we encourage you to do this to you shall cover telehealth services, and by the way, you'll pay the same amount. And a couple of states are recognizing that they're saying that you must let your network providers um, have access to the technology to provide services as well, and you have to pay them, by the way. So next slide, please. So less common policy change that we're seeing, but there we are seeing as far as what the states are doing is that they're expanding the modalities beyond phones. Actually, not a lot of them are doing that. One or two are saying like, we're basically opening it up to just be on live video and phone. Um, there also, a few of them are expanding the list of eligible providers. So there were a couple of states who specifically said we're expanding this to some of the allied health professionals who are a lot of times not included within the telehealth policies as eligible providers. So they are expanding those a couple of states. It's not as widespread as say, you know, allowing the home to be an eligible site. And then waiving consent requirements. So there are actually quite a few states that have on their books or within their Medicaid policy specific consent requirements that you need to get before uh, you utilize telehealth. They're relaxing those or they are either waiving them completely. Next slide, please. And here are some resources that are here. Um, like I said, it like happened last night. So it looks like the slide that I did do about the recent CMS changes did not make it on here. So um, let me just verbally, and I'll make sure that it is updated um, in the uh, PowerPoint <clears throat> that we will make available to you. Um, you're, everybody's more than welcome to download my slide, but a couple of things that I'll go over there. Um, some of the things that have been changed from last night 
for what CMS just released is that um, providers need to put their home address. There's been like an issue that if a provider underneath Medicare has been providing services from their home, they have to put their home address. Uh, that's been an issue for some telehealth providers because that's public information. People can see where you live. So CMS is saying like, we're, we're gonna like allow you to put a facility's address. You don't have to put your home address. Um, there was an also a change to 42 CFR 483.3, the requirement that physicians and non-physician practitioners perform in-person visits for nursing homes. They said, if it's appropriate, you can do that via telehealth. They added additional codes for reimbursement. Some of them include um, initial nursing facility visits, but there was a whole list of other codes. They also expanded audio only services. They added additional codes for that. So you can use the telephone to provide those services. And they also removed frequency limits. So pre-COVID-19, there were limits on like how many times you can use telehealth. So they removed the limits on um, subsequent in inpatient visit limits, which was once every three days, that's been removed. Subsequent SNF visit limitations, which was once every 30 days, that's been removed. And then critical care consult of once per day, that was also removed. So those were the most recent changes that have happened. And um, if we go to the next slide, please. I think that's it, so thank you. Thank you, May. Um, this is Timmy. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, yes. great. Yes. Um, so I, we are getting a lot of questions and I'll just remind everyone that we will be sending out the materials. Um, there's definitely interest in those materials and the recording will be made available to you and we welcome you to share them with your colleagues. Um, in addition, I believe all of our panelists are available for offline questions as well. Um, so we will make sure that you have their contact information. And there are several questions um, that I think are dealing with HIPAA right now. But before I get there, May, I'll start with you. With all of these waivers, what are you hearing um, that may be post COVID-19? Let's, um, let's start there. Uh, do you think that there might be some uh, possibility that some of this might stick in the long term? In the long term, yes, I do think some of these things will stick. I think probably one of the things that has the likely highest likelihood of sticking is allowing the home to be the originating site, expanding that. I think some of these unusual little limitations that they put on telehealth, such as like, oh, for a sniff, you can only have it like once a month. Some of those restrictions will most likely stick as well. And also expansion of some of the services. And I hope also expansion of some of the eligible providers as well. The ones that I'm not quite sure will stick around, I'm not sure if phone will actually stick around, to be quite honest. That one I'm a little uncertain about. In emergency situation, they're allowing it now, but staying around post-COVID-19, I'm not so sure, but I think probably the best ones are the location ones and the expansion of providers and expansion of services and removing some of these odd little kind of limitations that they have, like on frequency of visits. Um, and let's, uh, let's, let's hit the HIPAA. HIPAA discussion next. Um, there are several questions about what does it mean for HIPAA to be waived at this time, uh, ranging from um, can we have conversations with the patient when there's a roommate in the room to the devices that are being used um, with the, you know, not being HIPAA compliant like FaceTime or Alexa room. Um, HIPAA, do you want to, or May, do you want to start there? <laughs> And then I will um, hand it over to Joshua and Stephen on how it's being done practically in facilities. Yeah, so basically all that they have said is that OCR won't find you. So as, as a telehealth resource center, and I know the other telehealth resource centers have been doing this, we have still been cautioning people, like try to keep to HIPAA as much as possible if you can. They have said that, oh yes, you can use some of these other platforms that you know may be like more readily accessible. Um, we still, we still counsel people or suggest to people that they do still try to do um, licensing with entities that do offer some uh, a, a business associate agreement just to meet these HIPAA compliancy standards. Um, it is a bit of a, 
I don't want to say wild west, but it is like kind of this evolving environment where you're just, I understand, I understand people are trying to do this as quickly as possible because the need is just there. It's an urgency thing. But what we are suggesting where you can just stick as close as possible to keeping to those HIPAA requirements and rules as you're going through this. We understand the exp expediency of doing this, but just do that. That will like save you probably a lot of grief at the other end because there are still like state laws that impact this. It's not only about HIPAA, but the, like, for example, I'm based in California. I know California has much more stringent protections around healthcare information and privacy as well. Granted, some states are relaxing those. So there is that too, but it's just, uh, if you can, keeping in mind that you're trying to do this as quickly as possible, if you can try to keep as close as possible to what you normally would in a HIPAA still is in play environment. <laughs> A great point. Um, the states will have um, their own guidelines as well to be to review. Uh, Josh or Stephen, do you want to also take a uh, add in on how you're seeing HIPAA being relaxed in a practical level? Uh, sure, I, I can go first. In terms of relaxation, I, I think once again, like May was saying, we're trying not to relax them unless we have to. And we're trying to use the most uh, approved and appropriate resources that we have. But if we can document that we can't, then, then we go forward and, and use um, other things. And so internally, at least we our UPMC has released a, a memo stating what's allowable. Uh, and that, of course, flows down from uh, the federal guidance on that as well. So once again, when practicable, you could try your best. But we have to do the right thing by patients right now. I would agree with what Dr. Handler said. Okay, terrific. Um, May, uh, back to you just at a, on an initial visit question. Mm -hmm. that the question about for new admits, that they're asking the primary physician to see and assess the patient within 72 hours upon admission. Can the physician use telemedicine as the initial visit? Uh, for inpatient or? Uh, for a facility. For a facility, I believe they can. There, so, so, and I'm assuming you're talking about Medicare. If the question's about Medicare, so the, the thing oh, about so it's Medicare. Yeah. Okay. So the thing about Medicare is that they do it um, by code. So if the code is like on that list, it should be okay. Um, so it's it's not like they have like this blanket. Well, all consultations are fine or something. They do it by actual CPT or HIPAA code. So if it's one of those codes that's available underneath the telehealth, and, and keep in mind the the information that I said last night that they released, those include like new codes on there or new codes as in they weren't previously allowed via telehealth. So if 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 what you're doing falls into one of those codes, it should be fine underneath Medicare. And I just want to follow up. Prior to COVID-19, it was not allowable. No regulatory visits were allowed by telemedicine. Uh, given the information that we shared internally, uh, that is no longer the case during this time. So regulatory visits, including admission, subsequent care, et cetera, are allowable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it wasn't in the slides that I had, but um, I'll make sure that the slides that we post for people to download has that extra slide. I do have the link to the new information from CMS on there, so you can like download that access it that way. And I think this question is related and it is definitely in the coding weeds, but I just, and I don't know if um, any of you have this answer, but I'll ask it. And if, if we don't have the answer, we can respond as a follow-up, which is that per the coding specialist, telehealth visits with face-to-face -face video component are considered equivalent in in-person vis visit. Thus 9921X, which would be like 99213 or others, EM code should be used. Is this correct? Again, if it's for Medicare, it would depend on what their list of codes are. I don't remember the, all the codes off the top of my head. I mean, I don't know if like Steve or Joss, if you have more familiarity with that particular code. So if I understand correctly, and we should double check this, uh, and maybe the person who asked the question, if those are office-based codes, then that is the wrong place of service. The place of service, I believe that this discussion is all about is really focusing on, you know, traditionally 3132, but now of course telemedicine is a place of service. But my understanding is you would not use the 9921X, but the 99307 through 10 as a subsequent, um, and then you can use the uh, associated new admission, discharge, et cetera, major change of condition codes that are available. 
Yes, and there's uh, someone else just piped in saying the same thing, um, 99304 to 99306. So we'll, we'll come back to make sure that that is, uh, quali is qualified and uh, detailed. Um, there's another question about uh, who would you recommend as the telehealth facilitator? Um, I know, Joshua, you had that in your slides about, um, you know, making sure you have a facilitator on staff. Do you have um, an idea to give folks about the role and who should be playing that role? Certainly. So, you know, on the slide, I, I referenced quite a few different people that could be on the other end, such as nurses, uh, CNAs, uh, EMTs, and also, I believe, medication assistants. Um, typically, in the work that we do and when we implement this and train a site, we like to see someone with somewhat of medical training on the other side. So our recommendation is um, a licensed nurse uh, of some level. Um, in today's time, you know, anybody who has an understanding of that medical history, it, it will suffice. But our recommendation is typically having a, a nurse on the other end when possible. Wonderful. Thank you. And this question is for both Stephen and Joshua, um, that do, what would you recommend for those folks that may not have telehealth capabilities in place today? Can you give us a use case of what they can do quickly um, in order to make use of tools and be able to care for their patients? Dr. Handler? Sure, so I, I think we don't wanna overlook the phone. We don't want the technology to get in the way of care. I think that a lot of uh, telephonic based medicine is sufficient, especially once again, if the nurse is your primary customer and they have a quick question. I think telemedicine is useful as a layer on top of that for certain circumstances, um, pulmonary exam, cardiac exam, et cetera, and, and other approaches depending upon the clinical capabilities. However, if you wanna lean in that direction, my thoughts are um, technology is actually kinda hard to get right now. Some, you, you know, you can even get webcams and sometimes mice and computers. One of the things that seemingly have not dried up totally and is still widely available are tablets. Um, and then layer on top of that, the guidance that uh, we could provide you with which applications are allowable. Of course, that needs to be on both ends, the originating site um, and, and the distal site. But that's my quick take, Josh. I don't, I don't know if you have a different opinion about that. No, I would share uh, the same opinion. It's pretty similar to what I said earlier in my presentation too. I mean, obviously um, you don't want uh, the technology to get in the way of doing this, like you said, Dr. Handler, um, but there are a lot of options out there. And you need to really think through um, not only what is available, but what's gonna best meet the needs that I'm trying to take care of right now. You know, I, I just wanna add that do the right thing, do whatever it takes to care for patients. I mean, we took an oath and I think we've seen in real time that by and large, the government's behind in what most of us have been out there doing in terms of saying it's okay. But I always say, always do the right thing and then let's figure out some of this uh, afterwards. So uh, that, that's just my one comment. Wonderful, and, and I will also um, add in there that many of your partners, community partners, whether they be a health plan, or um, a public or a private hospital will have telehealth capabilities as well that they may be able to help with onboarding um, you know in a in a much quicker fashion because the agreements are in place folks to be able to follow these changing um, changing policies as well as other resources um, for telehealth in long-term care facilities. So for the policy end, you can go to CCHP's website or you can also check CMS's website if you're specifically interested in Medicare. They are updating you know, very frequently as well. Um, the telehealth resource centers, all of them have created like a COVID-19 resource page 
packages that are really good, especially if you have questions about where I get started. So um, they are also, I, I highly suggest that you look at your uh, regional telehealth resource center. Like I said, they cover specific states for more information too. Um, I also know that the American Medical Association has also put out some information related to telehealth and COVID-19. So that is also like another good place for you guys to find some resources. Wonderful. And we will send those out to everyone um, with the with the materials. Um, back, Joshua, there's another question about addressing the physical exam component. And I know that you are also you had some peripherals on your on the slide um, that was being facilitated by the telehealth assistant. Could you explain what what and how that's being used in practice? Yeah, Dr. Handler might actually be able to answer this oh. um, better than myself as the clinician. So I'm going to I'm going to actually pass this one over to him if he's all right with that. <laughs> Dr. Sure. Handler, you're it. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're a team. It's good. Um, yeah, so with regard to clinical capabilities, I think in this time of need, um, clearly audio and video, not just because we're trying to bill for it, but I think that gives you a good patient assessment. You know, what do they look like, right? And using your clinical skill set matched to the nurse and what do they look like? You know, how are they dealing and managing with the situation? And then adding to that, um, would be a Bluetooth or a digital or some kind of stethoscope to hear um, the heart and lung sounds, perhaps the abdominal sounds. We know there's some atypical symptoms sometimes associated with this process. But beyond that, at this point, not a whole heck of a lot. Our carts have more, but that's not needed. Other carts have more, that's not necessarily needed. I think what we're trying to do is minimize to get it out on the front lines. So less is more in this case. And just another clarification, I think we addressed this earlier in the HIPAA question, but Dr. Handler, do you want to just make, um, you know, a, a, a fine point, I guess, around when we say applications, what does that mean? And, uh, you know, what does HIPAA compliant mean versus what is not when we say sure. uh, telehealth? I, I may want to defer that to May because there was very specific language in, in applications that were mentioned, but I'm not sure if that was to be inclusive or exclusive where they were just examples. May, do you know what I'm talking about? It listed very specific yeah. applications. But yeah, they were talking like, you know, FaceTime or, you know, different types of like very common types of platforms that, that folks are probably familiar with, which was probably why they cited them as examples. Um, so the, the thing with being HIPAA compliant, and I, I, I always, even pre-COVID-19, I always warn people when they said like, oh, I bought X, I bought X equipment, so and they said that it was HIPAA compliant. It, the equipment isn't necessarily HIPAA compliant because HIPAA, to meet HIPAA compliance, requires actually human action as opposed to like, oh, I have like this piece of equipment and therefore I'm like set. Um, the equipment does offer you the features to help you meet HIPAA compliance, such as maybe they have encryption um, capabilities or something like that to, you know, but it, it, it's really more on like, you know, how the, the staff conducts themselves and what they do and the protocols that they have in place as opposed to like the type of um, equipment or platform you use. Now, again, the equipment and the platform does offer or may have features to help you meet those HIPAA compliance standards, such as, as I mentioned, the encryption. Earlier mentioned like a platform that's willing to sign a business associate agreement. So for those who may not be familiar, um, one of the things to, uh, basically if you're using like a third party and they may have access to the health information, you need to get like a business associate agreement with that with them in order to say like, yes, you know, we won't access the information, et cetera, whatever you put in the business associate agreement. There are some platforms that will not sign that business associate agreement and others that do. So that's one thing to, to be aware of um, when you're trying to meet HIPAA compliance. Again, in this environment where they're saying We've, we're relaxing that, we're not going to fine you if you don't exactly do that. I would suggest that that is something that might be like kind of an easy thing for you to do because there are you know, platforms out there where they would be willing to sign like a business associate agreement. So, you know, you just find one of those and you check off that box and make sure that at least, you know, you in pre COVID-19 world without this relaxation, you still met that standard. So those are just, you know, some of the things that are out there to keep in mind too. And I think one more question I'd love to be addressed, um, and may this may be to you, which is um, with billing, have, has, uh, has there been any timeline that's been recommended um, 
in order to make sure that your encounters or your bills are submitted or do you have some time to figure it out? So um, what there have been, no, not sort of like, oh, you need to submit them within 24 hours type of things. What there have been is that for some of the policies, they have backdated them saying like going back to like March 1st, you can like do bill this way and or you can like use telehealth oh, to like provide the services so there's been backdating but no timeline of like you must get it in within a month I, one thing though about billing that i will warn you because we have encountered this with questions coming into the telehealth resource centers is is keep in mind that they may have changed the policy but it may take time for the processors to get caught up and recognize that oh yeah that policy has changed so it is okay if you did this by phone and like say that that's okay or that you did this in an urban area in Medicare. Um, we have encountered some people submitting claims in and having them rejected and they've had to like, you know, go, go back and forth with their Mac to like, you know, in the processing. That may take time for these institutions to kind of shift themselves to accommodate that. So I just wanted to warn you about that. Be persistent. I know that feels like it's you're just you're like, why am I spending so much time doing this, getting this one claim paid? But it, it is just taking some of them time to like go through that process too. Good point. Well, I think we're at our time, and I see that our questions, um, I think, are have mostly majority have been answered. So what we will do is make sure that all of your questions are answered in a follow up Q and A. And again, um, we welcome you to follow up with us and our panelists for additional questions. Our aim is to be able to get information out as soon as possible. And I want to thank our sponsors today. This would not be possible without their help. We have West Health, AARP, the National Telehealth Health Resource Center, CCHP, which is the Center for Connected Health Policy, and the project that they lead, which is the California Telehealth Policy Coalition. And we are also helping to staff this Blue Path Health. Health. Um, again, thank you everyone. Uh, you are on the front line. Thank you for what you're doing. And uh, we're here to help. Have a great, have a, have a great day. <laughs> thank you. Thanks everyone, stay safe. Safe and sound. <laughs>